This is our last narrative PowerPoint of the semester. We're going to talk a little bit about the Communist Manifesto, written by Karl Marx, but also influenced by his partner in philosophy, Friedrich Engels. Picture of Marx and Engels. This is Marx. This is Engels on the left. They were friends and collaborators on uh, developing the theory of communism. Marx was the more flamboyant and media savvy, I guess, of the two, so he, he gets most of the attention, but let's not forget Friedrich Engels. Marx was born in 1818. He died in 1883, so this is the context in which uh, he lived. He was German, but he, was, um, he lived quite a long time in London and in the United States of America as well, so he did a lot of thinking about and writing about capitalism and economic policy. So the Communist Manifesto is sort of as much an economic argument as it is a political argument, as so many things are. Engels was born in 1820, died in 1895, so they lived um, at the same time as uh, people like John Stuart Mill lived and were writing and thinking about the impact of industrialization and the impact of urbanization and uh, class distinction kind of at the same time. And you, you do see some parallels in thought between um, Marx and Mill, although they are very different. They both, they were all concerned about equality in some ways and, and putting value into everybody's lives and not just the valuing the lives of the rich. Um, Marx and Engels developed a theory that is sometimes referred to, oftentimes referred to as historical materialism. It's based on the, the sort of philosophical structure of a guy named Hegel. And Hegel argued that different eras in history are characterized by sort of man constantly seeking to find uh, himself, the God in himself. And Hegel sort of argued that, the, that history not history like time, but history in terms of change and progress will reach its pinnacle, uh, a sort of state of perfection when the distinction between man and God is kind of closed up and man has finally realized his, his divinity in that sense. I'm probably badly mistaking a Hegel, so Hegelian scholars would probably scream at me, but I think that's kind of the gist of it. Marx instead argued that um, history is actually the history of economic change, that what characterizes changes in history in different things that we call different sort of historical eras can actually be boiled down to changes in the way goods and services are manufactured and the relationship that um, people have, the economic relationships that people have with one another and, and Marx argues that this is actually um, very practical and pragmatic. That's as part of why it's called historical materialism. That doesn't have anything to do with God or the divine or trying to seek enlightenment. It just has to do with we get better at making things or we change the way we make things. And that has economic ramifications. So the Communist Manifesto is Marx and Engels' statement of social, socialist ideology. And essentially, it's an argument in favor of as it, eliminating capitalism and replacing it as an economic system, but then also would certainly have political ramifications with a system in which everything is owned in common and everybody works toward the common good rather than their own individual profit. Marx argues that history is the history of class struggle. So different eras have different relationships between different classes of people and different classes become more dominant at different times and this shifts us into a different era. So Marx sort of um, starts with the idea that the world as mankind actually developed was um, probably characterized by what he calls a sort of primitive communism, where everybody worked the land, everybody was struggling to find enough food to eat, and people kind of worked communally to, to hunt and gather and then share out the, the food. That morphed into a sort of slavery era, where some people's labor was subjugated 
um, to the wealthy and to uh, those who had more means. We shift from a sort of slave master kind of economy into one that's more um, feudal, where there are landed gentry and then people work the land and they pay taxes to the landed gentry and the, the landed gentry own all the land and the people sort of eke out an existence, sort of morphs into um, a mercantile kind of uh, economy where there are sort of small shop owners and guilds of people who make things and they take on apprentices and then those apprentices learn a skill and um, the, the small businesses then eventually over time consolidate into uh, capitalism where larger and larger industries are established as we develop um, industrialization and uh, electricity eventually gets developed and, and the ability of people to build giant factories and use steam or whatever to make those factories go. And that changes the relationship between the workers who no longer have to make an entire product. They only have to make a portion of a product and part of an assembly line type way of manufacturing um, changes the relationship between workers and their labor and also workers and the people who own the businesses. And so as more and more and more wealth gets consolidated into fewer and fewer and fewer industries, um, Marx argues that then capitalism has become the new economic reality. And what Marx argues is that the modern bourgeois society was born out of this sort of mercantile feudalism and then mercantilism and the and then the, the growth of industries. And what Marx argues is that the reason that that historical materialism is a better explanation than what Hegel was explaining was that Marx argues that Marx argues that in any economic era um, there is what is called um, the substructure. The substructure is the way goods and services are manufactured, goods are manufactured, and that's uh, capitalism or feudalism or mercantilism or a slave-based economy or whatever, that's the substructure. And then what happens is that everything else, which um, Marxist philosophers and people who talk about Marxism are called the superstructure, that the superstructure is all of the um, political institutions, religious institutions, the media, educational systems, um, social systems and customs and um, political ideologies, etc. They all grow up out of this substructure and serve to support it. So, for example, um, capitalism is based on the notion of private property. So a lot of our law develops, and you see this with John Locke, of course, but a lot of our law develops around the idea that private property ownership is good, that it's the key to success. And so private property ownership has to be in the law um, codified and, and protected as if it is a universal truth that private property ownership is sort of the key to economic progress. Marx would argue also that religious teachings arise out of this as well. So you look at, for example, the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not steal. If you don't believe in private property, if private property isn't part of your mindset, it doesn't make any sense to have a provision in your religion that says you shouldn't take what is what belongs to somebody else. And if you look at our media, for example, there are most of our television programs, most of our um, books that are written, et cetera, are written within the framework and structure of capitalism. People pursue wealth, they, they talk about opening restaurants and what it means to have a profitable restaurant. And they're all, um, we have game shows where people compete for money so they can be wealthier than other people, et cetera. And that's what Marx argues um, these these superstructures change as a result of changes in um, in the substructure, the economic, basic economic structure. So, um, so um, Marx 
identifies two groups of people who are functioning in capitalism. He calls them the bourgeoisie and the proletarians. And the bourgeoisie are the people who own the private industries, especially large industries. If you owned a small business, you would be part of the petite bourgeoisie. And the small shop owners are people who are really kind of proletariat, but they aspire to be bourgeoisie. So um, the bourgeoisie, what he's really raging against in um, the Communist Manifesto is the bourgeoisie as the big giant prop, uh, business owners like Jeff Bezos and um, people who own huge big corporations like Amazon or big manufacturing um, industries and and who run um, factories where um, things things are are mass produced etc. Um, those are the bourgeoisie. They have most of the wealth in the world and they have most of the political power in the world. And Marx argues that once an economic interest becomes the most powerful economic interest, they will always translate that economic power into political power and then use their political power to reinforce their own um, uh, primacy and, and protect their own interest using the political process as a way of doing that. The proletarians are the laborers. Those are the people who work mostly for the proper profit of the bourgeoisie. They don't own the means of manufacturing. They are simply a part of the manufacturing process or a part of um, they're a waiter or they're um, a flight attendant or they're a, a person who works on an assembly line or whatever. And they are the people who work so that the business can be successful. And as a as in exchange for their labor, they're given um, a paycheck and Marx argues that capitalism is geared toward profit. So capitalism has as its core a, a sort of tendency to prefer paying people as little as they can get away with paying them while still having a, a labor force that's willing to work. So ideally, um, the goal of capitalism is to maximize profits. Well, labor is a cost. So the more you can lower the cost of manufacturing your good or providing the, um, the, the product that your industry or your business uh, produces, the more profit there will be for the people who own the business. At the, and it will always come, Mark says, at the expense of the people who actually produce the profit, the people who are the laborers. So... What Marx argue is that the growth of modern industry, the type of industrialization that has taken place, mostly in, at the time, Marx argues in Western kinds of countries where there's been a lot of industrialization, England and um, other parts of Europe, and certainly the United States, North America, where um, there is a huge uh, bourgeoisie driven uh, mass manufacturing um, economy. Marx argues that this growth of modern industry has created enormous gaps between the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. Marx argues that in previous eras, there was a there was more of an interconnectedness between uh, say business owners or the landed gentry, and the um, and the workers. So uh, a person who apprenticed him or herself to a guild member and became a weaver or a shoemaker or a spinner or something like that would be a valued member of the guild potentially, but certainly a valued part of the um, economic process as a person. It wasn't great. It's not like Marx was saying that workers have always been better taken care of than they are under um, under capitalism. He doesn't say that the relationship was always one of absolutely 100% mutual benefit. But in previous eras, people who, I don't know if you want to say exploited other people's labor, also recognized a, a sort of reciprocal responsibility to kind of take care of them a little bit. Um, 
Now, Marx may be exaggerating history somewhat. Obviously, he, he was writing in a time that was much less enlightened than we think of ourselves in terms of how people have been treated um, historically. But what Marx argues is, regardless of what he argues about previous eras, what he argues is that under, under capitalism, the worker, the proletariat, the laborer means nothing to the business owner. They are simply pieces of the manufacturing process, just like the machinery is, and equally interchangeable. Uh, because Marx argues that with the growth of modern industry, nobody really needs to be a specialist. Nobody really needs to be all that skilled in order to make a product. And uh, all you have to be able to do is, is the few steps necessary to create part of a product. And this is what Marx has a concern about. Um, as the economic growth of the bourgeois class has, has grown, they have also been able to acquire a tremendous amount of political power. And so as these modern industries develop, the people who own these industries run for office, they pay for other people to run for office, they uh, acquire political power, then they use that political power to pass legislation that benefits them. Um, and, uh, and Marx argues that this sort of has a reciprocal, the more economic power you get, the more political power you get, the more political power you get, the more you're able to um, to enforce your economic power. And all of this, Marx says, um, comes at the expense of the worker. Marx says that skilled workers from the past have now become mere wage earners. They're, they're not required to be skilled anymore. They're just required to do a small part of the manufacturing process. So in the industrial age, nobody makes a shoe. Somebody makes the sole of the shoe, fills the mold. Somebody else um, rivets in the shoelace uh, rivets. Somebody else stitches in the tongue, if we're making a running shoe or something like that. Somebody else embroiders on, I don't know, the Nike swoosh lo logo or something like that. But nobody makes the whole shoe. And nobody needs to know how to make the whole shoe. And your value as a laborer is... How fast can you do your small portion of the shoemaking process, for example, and how many shoes collectively can one group of workers um, spit out so that they can be sold for a profit and, and then that profit can be uh, divided up amongst the people who own the business. Now, some of that profit has to go to the workers because most people won't work for free, but the capitalism is designed to make sure that the workers get the least amount of profit possible so that most of the profit can go into the, um, the people who own the, own the business or invest in the business, if you want to think about the Dow Jones Industrial or something like that, the stock market. So Marx argues that um, there are costs associated with making a product. He, he didn't make this up. This is just, this is just the way economic, economics works. Um, so the bourgeoisie, the people who own the business, they have to put some of their own money in, at least at the beginning, right? Somebody's got to buy the building. Somebody's got to buy the land, build the building, um, put the uh, infrastructure in place for the, the manufacturing of the product and pay for the cost of maintaining and then pay the labor to make the product. So there's a there's a there's a cost to making a shoe, and it includes all kinds of things, some of which uh, are paid for by the business owner, at least at the beginning, and some of which are produced by the workers. And what what Marx argues is that modern production mechanisms have stripped stripped workers of their humanity. So instead of um, their labor and their skills being an important part of who they are and recognized as such so that they're recognized as skilled workers, they're seen merely as a cog in a machine and as replaceable as a cog in a machine. And this is sometimes referred to as the theory of surplus value or the labor theory of surplus value. And the idea here is that in order for capitalism to function, in order for, for a business to survive, 
in a capitalist economic structure, there has to be more profit. The, the cost of producing the product has to be less than the product can be sold for. So whatever is excess of what it costs to actually manufacture that product is profit. And what Marx argues is that under capitalism, a laborer, a worker, a member of the proletariat can never make what their labor is worth because capitalism won't work if the if the cost if 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 a worker is paid exactly what um, corresponds to the portion of value that they have put into the profit, then there will be no profit. Right, because once you take into account all of the costs, the fixed costs of building something, the cost of the machine, the cost of running the machine, electricity, paying your taxes on, on the land or whatever, um, whatever isn't spent on making the product is profit. And labor is part of the cost of making the product. So if a worker were to be paid commensurate to the contribution that they make, to building the product, there would be no profit, um, or there would be very little profit because it is, Marx argues, the laborers ultimately who make the product. They're the ones who run the machines and they're the ones who actually manufacture the product. And so the value of their labor is surplus. There's surplus value in the product that they produce. They don't get, if they get paid a dollar, but there's $10 worth of profit, then all of that profit goes to the person who owns the business rather than the person who labors in the business. And so what Marx argues is that um, the, the workers get paid only a fraction of what they contribute to the overall creation of profit. And then all that profit goes to the uh, bourgeoisie and their investors. And that leaves the worker with less than the value that they put into the product. If the theory of surplus value kind of works that way. You can tell I'm not any kind of. So this is a this is a um, a cartoon from a long time ago that illustrates this. So this is all the wealth. This big giant bag is the wealth that's created by labor. And these are the people who do the work. Look how he's all sort of stooped over, probably old be be. Um, before his time, he's wearing patched clothing. He's obviously very poor. And he's the one who creates all this lab all this wealth. And then this is the capitalist. Obviously, he's very well fed. He um, is well dressed. He's got a lot of money. He probably eats too much. He smokes cigars because he's so capitalist. And this is the wage that the laborer gets paid. So they're creating all this wealth. And then they get back this little pittance. And the smaller the capitalist can make this wage, the better it is for the capitalist. And so this is an illustration of this theory of surplus labor and how it, it exploits the worker so that the capitalist can get fatter and fatter and fatter. Another illustration of the same sort of thing. This is, um, it's actually a pretty famous <laughs> illustration, but it shows this machine. And this is a machine that manufactures things. And you can see that the person is slowly being subsumed into the machine. They're becoming just a cog, just another rotary wheel, just like all of the other um, inanimate parts of the machine. And they have no value as individual people. They're just this part of this machine. But the machine can't produce the product on its own. And therefore, the, the worker is part of the machine, but not really valued as an individual person. So what Marx argues is that the only way to stop this because of the political power of the bourgeoisie and, and the, the way capitalist society teaches people that capitalism is the way to riches. So even if you're a poor laborer, you're told, oh, if you work really hard, you can become the property owner someday. You can start your own business, which might be true for some people, but isn't true 
most people is a call for revolution. What Marx argues is the proletarian class is much bigger than the bourgeoisie. And this has been, we've known this from the history of time, right? That there's more poor people than there are rich people. There's more workers than there are owners. And Marx argues that this is true not only in industrialized nations, but it's true throughout the world. The proletarian class is much bigger than the bourgeoisie. And um, that gives the proletariat a certain amount of power. And Marx argues if you look at unionization, for example, um, that's a, a nod essentially to the power of the proletariat that um, business owners know that they have to give workers, if workers recognize their common interests, the bourgeoisie are in trouble. And so what Marx argues is that the bourgeoisie sort of tolerates unionization as a way of suggesting to the laborers that they're now being treated fairly, that they have, um, they can negotiate their wages and they can negotiate better working conditions. But Marx argues that unionization is a, at best a band-aid on a gaping wound and that eventually whenever it is in the interest of the bourgeoisie to strike down the labor unions or to um, demand that the labor unions give in to um, uh, the need for the bourgeoisie to make more profit, that unionization can go as quickly as it came. And we've actually seen that in the United States. Unions represent a much smaller fraction of the workforce than they did previously. And of course, we know, not in California necessarily, but in a lot of other states, um, anti-union forces have gained a lot of political power and, and established what we call right to work legislation, where um, the union can't demand that people join the union in order to be able to work at a factory or in a, a manufacturing plant or something like that. Marx argues that Marx would argue if he wasn't dead um, that this is a this is evidence that he was right about unions that they're not an answer they're not a way to make capitalism work for the worker ultimately um, they give a sort of false sense of security so if you get if you have a union job and you get paid twenty dollars an hour which is ten dollars an hour more than you made before there was a union Marx argues that even if you're getting paid twenty dollars an hour the the business will not ever let your wage go so high that it eats into the profit ultimately or or creates less than acceptable profit for the people who run the business and so the basic relationship between workers and owners is not changed under unionization it's just um marx would argue sort of a facade that things have gotten better when when really it just sort of perpetuates this inequality and puts a um, a pretty face on it Marx argues that really the, the only real cure is revolution and the overthrow of capitalization by the proletariat and the taking over of the means of production by the people who um, are working for the bourgeoisie have to take power away from the bourgeoisie and forcibly um, eliminate capitalism. And revolution will bring an end to private property ownership. And Marx acknowledges that the, um, the revolution is gonna be really bad for the bourgeoisie, <laughs> at least at first, um, it's gonna be very bad for the bourgeoisie. But what will happen is, instead of having all of the decisions that affect everybody be made by a few elite wealthy people, decisions will be made collectively by the people. Marx calls communism true democracy, where people really do have a voice in um, how goods are produced, how um, uh, the rewards of work are shared out, uh, and communism can provide that by eliminating capitalism, which benefits only a few wealthy people. Marx argues that this will require a period of, of re-education because essentially what Marx is arguing is that in order for communism to become the new economic model, human nature actually has to change, right? So think about how Plato talked about human nature. He talked about it as something that's sort of malleable, that through proper education, through censorship of the literature, through sort of repetition of certain kinds of stories, you could, Plato argued, make people see themselves as part of a communal whole whose interests, individual interests, 
must always be aligned with what's in the best interest of the communal whole, right? That was the whole idea behind creating this guardian class, that you want to eliminate the distinction between mine and not mine. And Marx comes back to that and he says, we have to eliminate this distinction between private and public and make everything be public so that everybody has an equal share and an equal interest in the success of the whole. But you have to remold human nature for that. Um, Marx sort of argues that the current generation, right, the generation that that is part of the revolution and then sort of after the revolution is probably a lost cause. They're going to have to be pretty severely oppressed because we are so deeply ingrained into believing in capitalism, to believing in private property ownership as if there couldn't possibly be another alternative that really the it's going to be the next generation and the generation after that who are going to make communism truly flower after the revolution happens because my generation and maybe even your generation um, were kind of a lost cause. So there's going to be a lot of oppression of, uh, well, I'm not part of the bourgeoisie and probably you're not either, but the people who, who have a lot of money uh, in, in the, in the world are going to be in for a rude awakening after the, um, so the goal of communism is that everybody works for the good of the collective, not for individual or company profit. And again, this is going to require um, the initial oppression of the bourgeoisie by the proletariat. For example, um, obviously the abolition of property is going to take from people things that they think belong to them by right, right? Think about Locke saying that we have a right to property. Marx says, you got you to get over that. That the revolution is going to bring an end to that way of thinking. Now, most people have um, questioned whether it's actually possible to do this, but um, but Marx uh, says that it is a very heavily progressive income tax. So, if there is any kind of transition or any kind of um, evolutionary sort of period from capitalism to communism, uh, it's going to have to come at the expense of the wealthy through heavily progressive income tax, where the more wealth you have. The, the less of that wealth you get to keep. You have to give it to the collective. Obviously, the um, elimination of inheritance rights, people would not be able to pass their property on to their children. They would no longer um, be entitled to own that property as a commodity that they can dispense of uh, as they wish. It will all go to the collective. Um, Lots of things would become centralized under communism. The idea is that everything would be produced collectively. So the banking system would be centralized and there wouldn't be uh, creditors and debtors and people loaning money to people, that all of the wealth will be would be managed collectively and nobody would get to um, be the profiter and other people are the debtors. Um, all of the transportation and communication systems would be centralized so that um, people aren't profiting from things that everybody needs, like the ability to get from one place to the other and to communicate and that kind of thing. Um, obviously, um, Marx would include things like the production of energy would be centralized. So you would have um, co-ops or um, owner-operated, essentially, uh, energy, because that's, that's something that everybody needs common ownership by the people through initially the state, but then ultimately Marx thinks that you wouldn't really need a government per se of all industry. So instead of the business owners making all the decisions and the workers just carrying out the orders, the workers themselves would have a, um, a collective role in deciding what products are produced and what um, who does what work and how the um, products are distributed, et cetera. Education would be free for everybody. Everybody would get the same education. There wouldn't be uh, fancy schmancy education for some people and um, substandard education for others. Um, we've sort of adopted this as um, a model, at least at the K through 12. We try to provide education for everybody. Um, an equal obligation of all to work um, as, as much as they can. Mark says everybody can contribute something. And so everybody should be expected to contribute something. Think about um, armies of workers uh, who collectively do the work that needs to be done, whether it's farming and um, growing crops or manufacturing clothing or providing the, the um, goods that can be traded for other goods and right, and in, in terms of making sure that everybody has 
uh, enough to eat and some sort of uh, basic uh, living standard. Nobody gets to have a better living standard than others, in theory. Um, so he, Marx argues that eventually, when all of these things are in place, human nature is going to be altered. So instead of seeing pe themselves as individuals who are in competition with other individuals, people see themselves as part of a larger whole. And Marx argues that this is universal. This is a, he thinks that the revolution is actually going to have to be, it's going to probably start in the industrial countries. He thinks, he thought it would actually start in the United States, which was the most industrialized. Um, but for various reasons, it didn't. Um, and eventually, Marx argues that um, when people begin to see themselves as having more in common with people in other countries, uh, that a worker in the United States is being exploited in the same way as a worker in Bangladesh or a worker in China or a worker in South Korea, then what will happen is that the workers will throw off their chains and they will collectively um, uh, band together to overthrow capitalism. And what Marx argues is that capitalism has a sneaky way of making workers think that they're in competition with other workers. So for example, if you hear people talk about immigrants coming into America and taking our jobs or outsourcing, if a company um, finds a cheaper source of labor in China or a cheaper source of labor in Bangladesh, for example, those jobs are our jobs, American jobs that are now being given to these people, these other people in other countries who don't shouldn't be entitled to those jobs. And Mark says that's how capitalism keeps the proletariat from uniting as workers by making us jealously guard the few jobs that the bourgeoisie will, will pay for. Um, Marx says ca capitalism is really good at that. And unless we can change people's perspective and perception, um, ca capitalism, well, I should say, when people change their perspective, that's when capitalism is, is going to be doomed. Eventually, Marx believed that national boundaries would disappear as a result of communism, that there would no longer be the need for um, different political systems and different economic systems. It would be a world, a collective world where everybody works together to raise up everybody's life and you would not have national boundaries and it would all be just one big happy world of communism. And finally, Marx argues that if true communism were ever to be established, you wouldn't need a state at all. There wouldn't need to be an authority that governs, that everybody would sort of collectively be the state, and you wouldn't need um, a centralized um, political system. He, he says that at the beginning, you probably do. You probably do need a kind of heavy-handed government because there's so much that has to change, right? Capitalism has to be dismantled and the bourgeoisie has to be stripped of their political and economic power. And you can't do that. Uh, that won't be easy to do. So at some level at the beginning of socialism or the beginning of the communist state, there has to be a sort of authoritarian, powerful political apparatus with the ability to punish and to um, force people to do things. Ultimately, Marx thinks that once everything settles down, you won't need that anymore. Most countries that have experimented with Marxist style revolution have really never gotten beyond the strong authoritarian beginning and morphed into the no state at all um, side of things. But Marx would say, well, that's faulty people, not faulty theory. So if you think about what Marx is saying, um, it's pretty scary to capitalism and to capitalists. So the idea that um, communism could come into fruition and strip people of their property and um, Marx argues that uh, all of the su superstructure that uh, gets built on capitalism would also die like religion and um, political, different political ideologies and, and that kind of stuff. You could imagine that some countries have had some pretty serious responses to communism. I just want to give you a, a this isn't a history lesson, but I just wanted to 
illustrate to you just how scary the United States found communism. It used to be back in the 40s, 30s, 40s, 50s, when we first started doing pretty serious and rigorous um, public opinion polling, when we asked people what group or what is the biggest threat to America, it was almost always overwhelmingly communism. Now we have other groups that we don't like. This group doesn't like that group. You know, this group thinks that this group is the biggest threat, but sort of universally, except for people who were communists, um, America was afraid of communism and it was perpetrated in, um, in government policies and it was um, taught to children that the communists were evil and that capitalism is good. And we went to great lengths to try to stop communism from getting a foothold in the United States. Socialism actually did get a, a bit of a foothold. And we have a lot of policies in place in the United States that were the, directly the result of um, some of these ideas of equality and these ideas of um, giving more power to, to everyday ordinary people. Um, we don't call them communists, but they certainly are a reflection of this notion of, um, of equality, the women having the right to vote, child labor laws, workplace safety laws, minimum wage laws, um, progressive uh, changes such as uh, developing primary elections so more people can vote and all of that. Those are all um, things that came out of um, movements that asked people to think about people as more valuable as individuals and to, and to shake up at least a little bit the power structure, even though the um, underlying economic system doesn't change. But we did have some, um, some laws and stuff that got passed too. So we, all, we, we learn in our history classes about what's called the Red Scare, which is usually associated with the um, beginning to middle part of the 1950s. But even way back in the 1920s, um, there were there's there were events. Um, for example, um, this guy Palmer was um, uh, the Attorney General of the United States, and somebody uh, ignited a bomb in front of his house. And as a result of these, what he saw as communist threats, he developed a, an agency within the Justice Department that was really tasked with kind of rounding up people who were suspected of being communists and who were suspected of being um, interested in fomenting uh, the violent overthrow of the government. And something like 6,000 people were rounded up as a result of these, um, of these efforts. A lot of them were deported. Um, eventually, the, the raids were found to be illegal and presumably stopped, but um, American opposition, at, it didn't end to communism. It was pretty scary. Um, m there are two laws that were enacted, one in 1940 and one in 1950, that um, sort of illustrate America's concerns about communism. The Act of 1940 was a, a law, it's actually still a law, that was intended to um, allow the government to punish anybody who advocated the violent overthrow of the government uh, or anybody who, as it was implemented, uh, belonged to organizations that were thought to advocate the violent overthrow of the government. And a lot of people got arrested and convicted under the Smith Act for teaching communism as a theory for um, forming communist organizations, even if those organizations weren't really pushing for the violent overthrow of the government. They were pushing for political mobilization or education or trying to convince people or persuade people of the ideas of communism without actually advocating for the violent overthrow of the government that Marx calls for. Um, they were nonetheless arrested and convicted. And in some early Supreme Court cases, like a case called Dennis versus the United States, those convictions were upheld and the government was given a great deal of power to kind of try to suppress, not just as it turned out, the actual planning to overthrow the government, but the expression of what the government considered dangerous ideas. And there have been subsequent Supreme Court cases that have taken a lot of the teeth out of the Smith Act. People can really no longer, in theory, be 
um, arrested and jailed and convicted for uh, merely holding ideas that the government finds objectionable. Um, but at the time, people were afraid of communists and they were afraid of the actual idea and, and wanted to punish people, hoping that uh, the idea would go away or that um, nobody would learn about it or that everybody would learn about it as a bad thing rather than a potentially good thing. The McCarran Act, which was passed in 1950, this is right about the time of the, um, the second Red Scare, was uh, McCarran was a member of Congress. And uh, what the McCarran Act did, and it was uh, parts of it were subsequently found unconstitutional, but it, it required organizations to provide the government with their membership lists so that the government could track people who belong to the Communist Party or um, what the government would consider to be sort of subversive groups. Um, these kinds of policies were also used to try to stop civil rights organizations from forming. So for example, the NAACP had to go all the way to the Supreme Court to keep its membership lists private. And the Supreme Court ultimately ruled that the First Amendment right to freedom of association prevents the government from keeping from requiring associations, even communist associations, from uh, providing lists of their members to um, to government entities. You can imagine the kind of economic harassment and the kind of government harassment that could come from um, that information getting into the hands of people who would use it to punish people for their ideas. Um, it, between 1950 and 1956 is usually what we associate with the Red Scare and, and the most visible aspect of our attempt to root out, quote unquote, communism in the United States um, took place in Congress. So there was a, uh, the HUAC is, is an acronym for the House Un-American Activities Committee. So this was a, an entity within the House of Representatives that um, would hold hearings to try to root out uh, Americans or people in America who were doing things that were un-American, like promoting communism. Um, in, on the Senate side, there was a senator named Joe McCarthy who um, headed up a series of hearings in which people from various industries, in particular um, intellectual circles and some um, media leaders were, um, they would be reported to this committee as being suspected communists, and they would have to go before these committees, and these committees would question their patriotism and question their commitment to America. And as a result of this, a lot of people lost their jobs, they got blackballed um, in their industry, they weren't able to find work, they were ridiculed and, and subjected to death threats, and it was a pretty scary time to be uh, what we would call to a leftist or to be a socialist or to to um, espouse uh, ideas that were inimical to um, con to capitalism and the quote unquote American uh, way of life. So Marx's ideas were revolutionary for their time. They have made their way in to government in some ways. We we have adopted some aspects of. Um, communism in the sense that we have a universal, we strive for universal public education. We do have um, some uh, centralized provision of services. So um, not all industries, but like, for example, we have um, cooperatively owned or citizen owned um, utility companies in some places, but Communism itself, of course, has never become an economic system or a political system that we live under in the United States. Marx would say, give it time. Marx says communism is not, not just, Marx isn't necessarily saying that this is the way the world should be. Marx is saying that this is the way the world is going to be, that communism is inevitable, that capitalism has within it the seeds of its own destruction that eventually, maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, maybe not 100 years from now, but eventually this economic era, era, just as all other economic eras in the past, will end. And Marx thinks that the new economic era is going to be communism. He could be wrong, <laughs> but this is what he says. Uh, his ideas were powerful. His ideas were scary. And um, I hope you understand them. Um, 
a little bit more than you understood them before you took this class.